You can connect it from anything. So can we switch it? We're good. Oh, awesome. Yeah, we're good. He's on. Yep. Should I start? Yeah, we're recording. Whenever you're ready. All right. You hey, everybody. Uh, hope you're ready to talk about Anthony Nasky. I want to start with just um, to explain what's going on in the room here. Um, no, that's not open yet. So what will you guys see on this other screen, I'm going to show here to anybody looking at the recording, is that we're looking at um, individuals drawing ANSI live as we talk. Um, so you can hopefully kind of get an idea of what it looks like for someone to start with a blank canvas and draw some ANSI. How do we know that it's live? Did somebody draw a dog? Uh, it might happen. <laughs> I specifically, <laughs> I specifically asked someone, not an individual, not to do it because it was likely it would happen, which probably means he's going to do it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's it's kind of the dong, sir, it didn't happen, right? All right. Well, the Wi-Fi is going bad, so the recording might not have this. If you switch but over, are you on the conventions network? It's not showing the um, speaker network. Uh, try conventions. Yeah, that's what I'm on right now. And that's what's not doing well. Uh, and frankly, it's not a crucial part of things, okay, so yeah. I'd rather not. The knock is getting knocked down. Right yeah, I'd rather not slow things down um, just for that. So it's going to be a little limited to people in the room, um, but what we see is some live drawing over on this other screen. So first of all, my name is Doug. I went by Lord Scarlet at the NCC and I still do online. I run a site called 16 Colors, which is an archive of ANSI art created by the underground art scene, ANSI and ASCII, over the past 20 years. Um, the, what we're going to talk about today is what ANSI is. Uh, the topic is a little bit of a misnomer. I'm not going to talk much about ASCII, but they run in parallel. Uh, it's just easier to focus on one instead of looking at all of them. The relationship it had to bulletin board systems, the underground scene that came out of bulletin boards and ANSI, politics of the underground art scene. What I really want to talk about, which is ANSI as art, and if we have time at the end, a little bit about archiving the ANSI scene. I have a ton of content to get through, so let's just dive right into it. ANSI is a primitive form of computer art that uses characters instead of pixels or lines. Um, so it's kind of a subset of what's known as text mode art. What most people probably picture for text mode art is ASCII. Um, and ASCII in the computer world is mainly just the lower end standard set of characters you see on the keyboard used to draw pictures. Um, there's a lot of information about there, out there about how text mode art existed long before computers with uh, typewriters, print setters, anything that took characters and put them on a page, people started to draw artwork with them. If you look at it in comparison to ANSI art, we see a pretty big difference in what the final product looks like. And when I talk about ANSI, what we're really talking about is, ANSI, is DOS. ANSI is specific to DOS. It used a couple set of specifications and became known as kind of this colloquial term of ANSI art that really doesn't actually mean anything except to the people that were creating it. It's made up of code page 437, which is a character set available in DOS. It also uses ANSI escape seats code sequences, which were sets of letters and numbers that did cursor positioning, color, all those various aspects. And when we're in ANSI, we have eight foreground colors and eight background colors. Uh, sorry, 16. Eight of them, the first eight can be foreground and background. The second eight are only foreground in standard ANSI art. And when I talk about all these characters available, there's 256 of them. The ones, the top 128 are what's known as the extended character set. In at traditional ASCII, uh, it's only the first 128. The other thing I'll point out to anybody who's a developer and works with ASCII versus Unicode versus all the other character sets is that in the art scene, ASCII refers also to code page 437. Unless you're talking about the Amiga ASCII world, which had its own character set, the other ASCII on other platforms. But when we're talking about ANSI, it's largely about 10 characters that are what we refer to as blocks. And of those 10, the most important 
are these four, which are known as F1, F2, F3, and F4. They were used to make a solid block of color as well as shading. So when we see red here, that would be the foreground color. When we see black, that would be the background color. So talking about ANSI is really irrelevant if you don't understand the uh, bulletin board systems. The DBS scene came up in the late 70s is when they first came out, and they thrived in the 80s and early 90s. And they're really a disconnected, anonymous form of communications uh, on computers. Hobbyists had a way now that they could talk to other computers, and they, they came up with bulletin board systems. If you had a computer and you had a modem, you could run a bulletin board system, and vice versa, if you had a computer and a modem and you had the number to a bulletin board, you could call it. Early, t early bulletin boards look like this, just straight text. Um, this is a, a modern incarnation of an old bulletin board, but this is what we're looking at on bulletin boards. But at a point, system operators, particularly of DOS-based systems, realized they could use code page 437 and ANSI escape code sequences to create menus that are a little more pleasing to the eye, a little easier to read, not just that straight monochrome screen. The problem is, if you look at ANSI, it looks like this. This is the wrong character encoding, we'll ignore that. But it's an escape code, and then a bracket, and a bunch of numbers and letters that specify character positioning, color. It's really not very easy to work with. So you see simple menus like that one I just showed. But in 1986, Ian Davis released the draw. Draw was a GUI ANSI editor, and the GUI was ANSI, and it allowed artists to use their keyboard to just draw and not worry about character codes, not worry about ANSI escapes code sequences. You see uh, down here at the bottom this blue bar with the 10 numbers. The way Davis got around drawing these extended character sets was that um, there were, I think, 10 sets of characters. 10 each that were mapped to the function keys. So that's how that those shading characters are F1, F2, F3, and F4. It's because they were 1, 2, 3, and 4 on that character set. And so from this, system operators could start creating more elaborate screens, um, start really customizing their boards. Game operators on bulletin boards in particular would use ANSI to make a more immersive experience, make it a lot more like the games people were playing on DOS outside of bulletin boards. Now, I don't know how many of you use bulletin boards. I, want, I see some heads going up. But I, for those that didn't, <laughs> I want to kind of frame it as to what we're talking about here. It's not about pixels per inch. It's not about resolution. What matters is that you can see 80 of these characters we're talking about across the screen and 25 down. If someone to rep, wanted to represent something more elaborate, they would uh, go what we call beyond the 25 lines. They would create an ANSI that was taller than this, but it would scroll off the screen. So when you log into a bulletin board system, this is what it looks like. You get one character at a time drawn across the screen, and these long ANSIs became known as scrollers. And so when you're logging into a board, this is how you get your information. It's also how you get the text-based information as well. You're really getting one character at a time drawn on the screen. And this, for those that have used boards. This is a simulated 14400 baud modem. Um, it's pretty fast for a lot of us that first logged in, but if you compare it to, uh, if you were first using dial-up internet on AOL, God forbid, or any other internet provider, you were probably at 57.6K. So this is, that was four or five times faster than this. A lot of us start at speeds four or five times slower than that. So out of this bulletin board, these bulletin board systems and out of ANSI art, the scene starts to develop. It's not surprising to all of you that are developed with computers that people start fractioning off into little groups. And that's what we know as the underground art scene. The first group that came about was Aces of ANSI art, otherwise known as AAA. And it was really just an affiliation. People would just, would, when they drew their ANSI, they put their handle on it, put AAA next to it, and that was the end of it. But shortly after AAA, Acid and Ice were formed, and they each somewhat independently, maybe not, it's hard to say, came up with this form of releasing zip files of all their artwork. A lot of groups started to follow, but Acid and Ice are really the ones that I'll focus on a lot. Not focus on, I'll mention them a lot. And that's just because they really did dominate the ANSI scene for 15 years. A 
lot of groups came about in that time, but they stuck around and they kind of uh, what everybody strived to be equal with. What these groups were, let's really just focus on the first three or four years of the ANSI. They were localized by area code, and that was the nature of modems, that you, it was cost prohibitive to dial outside of your own area code. So artists, uh, ten, any grouping on bulletin boards tend to be localized that way, just because it's cost prohibitive if we ignore freaking and all that stuff, which is a whole other topic. Um, but they'd take all their artwork, they'd zip it up into what became known later as art packs, and the groups were not just ANSI artists, they were ASCII artists, they were high resolution, or as we knew them at the time, VGA artists, coders, musicians, authors that did poetry and other stuff, people who were solely administrative staff to help the group running, help group members, help manage pack distribution. The packs are the important part of what was created kind of administratively by ANSI. They're generally distributed on a regular basis, monthly in most cases. Um, as we got to IRC, it became a lot, and the FTP, it became a lot easier to transfer this stuff around. And it contained, contained all the artwork created by the group members since the previous release. It was a lot like the software distribution model for Wares groups, um, bulletin boards. When it was just bulletin boards and we didn't really have much internet, the way Wares groups distributed their pirated software is they would they have set the bulletin board systems, particularly in their home area code. They would upload a copy of that piece of software, and then there were members of the group that were called couriers, and their sole job was to grab these pieces, these software releases, send it to a couple boards outside of the area code, and then a couple more couriers would pick that up, and it would kind of spider its way across the country. Um, Nancy, what's that? That's cool. It's, it's what you had to do. Yeah. There are a lot of ways around it. I'm kind of oversimplifying things. There was freaking, there were um, message networks that came up that you could use to transfer some of this stuff and do some of this communication. Um, again, a lot of these things could spend half an hour talking about just each one. Um, but our groups took the same model. They realized that it worked. And so they, they, were, they were trying to get this artwork out so people would see it, so people would um, want to be a part of the group or want work from the group. And they realized this was an easy way to distribute it, um, particularly with the ties that Nancy Seen had with the Wares community. It worked out pretty well. The packs contained artwork, as we mentioned. They're mainly to support bulletin boards. There were login and log off screens that were where users would either use a new password, apply for an account, check the status of the account. There were menus that obviously showed the options that were available on bulletin board. Message headers that would sit atop the messages and tell you who created the ANSI. The most important piece though were BBS advertisements. They were kind of the lifeblood of ANSI art, especially because it, it pushed that boundary of the 25 lines and allowed artists to really get creative with the art that they were creating. And it kind of symbolizes or demonstrates the symbiotic nature of ANSI and bulletin boards. Not only were packs used to distribute art, have the artists get their stuff seen and raise their prestige, there's also a way for bulletin boards to advertise. If your bulletin board had a piece of art, particularly in a group at the level of isocore acid, a lot more people are going to see that artwork. Um, it's it's going to have wares groups notice you and potentially use you as a distribution point for their wares. So it really was a level of prestige to have this art drawn for you. And so, so BBS advertisements were, again, kind of the lifeblood of ANSI art. The problem, if you notice this one that just scrolled by, is it's really long. Um, and the draw limited you to 100 lines at a time. So that became problematic for a lot of artists as they really started to push the boundaries. There were a way to concatenate files in DOS and get around it. But the real solution was uh, 94 ACID released the aptly named ACID draw which pumped pump that limit up to 1,000 lines. But that's not even really the most important part of the draw. It, it quickly replaced, uh, sorry, acid draw, it quickly replaced the draw as the de facto editor for the ANSI scene. And it was because of the 1,000 line limit, but it also introduced something that it, acid included in acid view a few months earlier, 
which is the concept of VGA breathing mode. Artists, up until this time, were working 25 lines at a time at that full 80 by 25 screen. But acid draw allowed an artist in real time to see what their ANSI looked like, blown out, viewed from top to bottom as a high resolution image. And it really pushed the quality of ANSI art. As we look at some of the art, I'll point out the times they were, but in particular, the portions really got better because previously an artist could only compare 25 lines at a time. So if you have the head at line one and the legs at line 300, you couldn't really make a comparison to do good proportions. PAX also had some just administrative things. They had a member list that showed the members of the group, contact information, their role. It was really just an excuse to draw more art. There was also the info file, which was a newsletter basically for the group to say what was going on in the group, new members, smack talk other groups, whatever they uh, felt they wanted to talk about in the pack. And that gets us to the politics. Um, again, if you spend more than five minutes on the internet, you know people fight with each other and sniff over stupid things. The NC scene was very competitive. So you see this hierarchy that I mentioned. Ice and acid were generally at the top level. A number of groups would float in and out of that top level status. And we really see a number of levels below. The way an ANSI artist generally worked in the scene was they would discover ANSI on a local bulletin board. They'd start drawing a little bit. They discover there's a local group, join that group, and in the process discover someone like Ice or Acid, discover the national scene, get on IRC, and join one of these mid-level groups and slowly work their way up to a group like Ice or Acid or Mirage, Gothic, Legend, these other groups that came up at that high level. Um, so I mentioned the wares scene. There was a pretty close relationship between ANSI and the hacker scene. Artists, a lot of what they did was drawing info files for software releases, working for boards that created, that released software. And a lot of artists got into this in the first place just to get access to those wares. That was really the goal of a lot of artists was, let me draw for a board that has elite status that I can't get access to. And if I draw them art, suddenly I have access to all the pirated software I want, all the cards I want, all the freaking information I want. But it created a almost too competitive environment to where cheating arose. The first form of cheating in ANSI is what's known as ripping. So an artist would take something that one ANSI artist drew and they'd take it as their own. You see here on the right, uh, Tempest Tales of ANSI from ICE in 1992. On the left is Primeval Acid from 1993. Normally ripping happened in small groups, localized, and nobody really realized it because people in the greater scene never saw it. But this one was discovered right away as soon as the pack was released because of the status of ice and acid. Primeval was immediately shunned, removed from acid, never heard from again. I've shown this to Christian Worth, who's running around with the camera, who was rad man of acid. Uh, he, ran, he has run acid through its whole life. And he told me a story I either never knew or didn't remember, which is Primeval was not actually a ripper. He was a member of ICE that joined under a fake name in order to make Acid look bad by releasing ripped artwork. So this really ends up just showing backstabbing and collusion that went on in the NC scene, particularly between ICE and Acid. We see a lot of sniping between them back and forth in packs. Um, they did a lot of the backstabbing stuff like the primeval NC. Uh, taking over IRC channels, um, making animations that make fun of the other group. This always takes a little longer than I wanted to <laughs> get to the punchline. It's, as you know, a 30 something year old isn't as funny as it was when we were 15. <laughs> <laughs> this was by Sonic of uh, Acid in 93, I think. This, oh, this is also an animation, which I'm not showing a lot of, but animation was possible in <laughs> ANSI art. Um, you don't see it a lot. Uh, after probably 93 or so, people really focused on the scrollers. If you saw animation, it was generally in a, uh, something from the demo scene or in a demo. Uh, we also see stuff from, yes. So how did they do it? I mean, like it's not, obviously it's predated GIF by about a million years. Um, well, it's not, I mean, if you think about the way the screen was drawn, 
it just instead of drawing the character at the end, it would draw it uh, somewhere else on the screen. Oh, so they're actually moving. They're then making a move command. And then exactly. Draw command. So move all command. the codes we saw for the answer so yeah. Okay. It's come something kind of gloss over, but yeah, the, there's cursor positioning, cursor movement, clear screen commands. Oh. Depending on um, if we have a bunch of time at the end, I'm going to show you a really long animation um, that uses. It, it's just it's pretty much what I consider the best animation out there by Jed, the best animation artist out there. Um, but so Ice did the same same thing. I don't know if you guys can read it very well, but that in the mouth of that guy is a, an acid logo. So we just see a lot of that sniping back and forth. The other thing is known as GIF2 ANTS, and it's using software to generate an ANSI from a high resolution image. Um, if you see a straight GIF2 ANTS, I, it's so kind of taboo, I couldn't find one in the time for the talk to create a GIF2 ANTS, that the software is hard to find. But it's, if you see a GIF2 ANTS, it wouldn't be mistaken for the art I'm showing today. It's pretty mediocre compared to it. But what some artists who were more talented realized is it was a shortcut. They could minimize it down to just the outlines and use and use um, use GIF2 ants to make that tra transition. So all they had to do was color and shade it and not worry about the outlines, which to some people was the tedious, hardest part. So this, I didn't put this example together. I know the artist here that's being accused of GIF2 ants. He has denied it. I don't know the real story. Um, I respect both the accuser and the artist. Who knows? But this is what people are looking for when they accuse someone of GIF2 ants. If we look at this wow. piece of work that was created from that source material, and we overlay the two, it's the outlines are near exact. <laughs> you generally don't see that when someone's hand drawing an ANSI from the source material. As an example, um, Christian actually put this together, but this this is one piece of source material with three different interpretations of it, and none of them take the exact outlines, the exact proportions, the exact angles. Um, as an ANSI artist, for one thing, you, you have to make some compromises to fit in the medium. So this is more what we would expect when we compare a piece of source material and not that exact comparison that you see on the, the previous slide. So the ANSI scene is really a quick rise and fall. In 1990, we see the first pack releases. By, 2000, or by 1997, we peak at about 700 packs in that year, and it quickly falls off. It's not surprising. The web's been released, people start to really get access to the internet and the web, and bulletin boards just aren't as relevant. Their DOS isn't as relevant because people are using Windows, Linux, Mac OS. So it's just not doesn't have the level of relevance that it once did, so it just starts to kind of plummet. Now the thing that happens in that time is that the competitive starts to disappear and we start to see a lot more collaboration. Uh, you see a lot more what are referred to as joints. Joints are ANSI's created by more than one artist. Someone would start an outline, transfer the file to another artist, he would do a little work and go back and forth until they had a final product. But in early 2000s, Curtis Wensley, otherwise known as Edo, released a web version, sorry, a Windows version of his editor, Pablo Draw, and it introduced a client server model. It's what we're seeing on this other screen. Um, there's, again, I don't know, it might be up to a dozen artists now, but a lot of people volunteered today to draw for the talk while it went on so that you guys could see what it is involved in going from a blank canvas to drawing ANSI. Um, and it, it just really raised the collaboration level of ANSI art. As an example, we don't need as much because we have the we did get the second projector, but in 2005, I put together, put up a Pablo server for a month uh, gave everybody the, the login information and uh, encouraged as many people as possible to draw. Over a month's time, we drew this long, elaborate screen for uh, a demo, convent, dem demo party called Pilgrimage, and it really shows kind of a progression of styles and artists and what was possible now that we could all just draw at the same time. So now we get to that I think is one part, and my okay. work should be, is ANSI as art. To me, ANSI is comparable to the pop art of the 20th century. We're seeing something that was created for function, that was created for advertising, that in the end is art on its own, even though it kind of had those monetary and functional purposes to start with. 
know, we, we just see this art come out of it that is amazing in retrospect at what they were able to do with the medium. We, there is kind of some formality out of the way, which is the way viewing ANSI has changed um, since DOS. The, the biggest piece of my minutia is if we look at this ANSI here and we look at those shading characters we're talking about, to the right of each one you see a solid line. It's what's known as the ninth bit or the ninth pixel in ANSI. Essentially, ANSI characters are 9 by 16. It's an oversimplification, but basically that's what they are. But when you look at a VGA preview mode ANSI, that line disappears. A lot of artists care about the difference between the two. Um, I don't think it's worth worrying too much about, but there are some artists, actually there was a pack release this year where someone made sure that people were looking at it in the right mode because it matters enough to them. It changes the proportions a little bit. There's some shading techniques used. Um, and then VGA preview mode again. People aren't really looking at it 25 lines at a time now. They're looking at it in some form of VGA mode, no matter where they're looking at ANSI. Even if you look at it in Pablo, um, it's not taking up the whole screen. It's not a CRT screen, which has different levels of blacks and little things like that. So let's reset, though. Let's go back to 1992, 1993. Pablo Draw is not out yet. These are some pieces of art that are being created by the top artists in the ANSI scene. This is the level of work that they're taking from, I'm not even bothering to show you what comes before this because it's so primitive. Um, we're really starting to push the boundaries of the ANSI. You don't really see anything over 100 lines because of the limitations of the draw. Um, but 1994, Acid Draw comes out. We'll jump a little bit to 1997 and we really see a difference in the quality of what people are able to create. We see a lot longer ANSIs. They, they look more like high resolution images when you zoom out, whereas those, those earlier ones wouldn't really be confused. You can tell that it's kind of a lower, um, you know, it's low, low res art. It doesn't take to have the same level of artistic value in mind. I mean, it does. And this ANSI wouldn't exist without those early artists. What's that? Those are fine grain detail. Right. It's, and the, you know, they wouldn't, this wouldn't exist without the early artists. You know, there's always a progression in any medium where everybody's <coughs> what was created before. Um, and I jumped to 1997 for a reason. We saw that graph, it peaks at 97 uh, as kind of a, what I refer to as symbolic, it wasn't at the time, but a symbolic gesture to 1997 is that Acid stopped releasing the NCL altogether in 1997. They continued to produce art as an art group, but it was solely high resolution images. Uh, it was solely high resolution images um, and they dropped ANSI art. And that's when people in the scene and, in, and outside the scene started to refer to ANSI as dead. ANSI, you constantly heard the refrain that ANSI is dead after 1997. But it, it didn't die, I'll touch that in a second. But the other thing we see starting in 1997, roughly, is what we refer to as new school ANSI. We start to jump to a, a style that evolves from the old school ANSI. The best example I have here is this ANSI on the left is by Lord Soth at Ice in 1995. On the right is Avenging Angel in 2006. Don't confuse this with a rip. It was a remix like you see in the music scene. Avenging Angel decided he wanted to take um, an old ANSI by a respected artist and show what he would do with it in the current style. Um, it's Hopefully some of it's fairly obvious. I tend to live in it and see it really easily, but if we look at the old school ANSI, we see very symmetrical, and this screen is not scaling very well, but we see very symmetrical shading. It's yellow and brown, the shaded brown. We don't see a lot of variation, whereas if we look at the one on the right, that shading is a lot more sporadic and a lot less intentional. There's also a lot more harsh shading if we look under her chin and in her hair. Um, those are all little things that symbolize new school ANSI. There's also little things that if you look at the background, again, the scaling doesn't show it very well. But uh, Lord Sauce ANSI is really just a plain blue background, but uh, Avenging Angel starts to throw in some little details that weren't there in the original piece. You may have noticed a lot of this art is from comic books. That's another trend that really flows through ANSI is what we refer to as comic rips. 
I tend to think that a large part of that is that comic books have the, the same kind of color palette and they have the sharp outlines that you see in ANSI. It lends itself really well to ANSI art. So we see a lot of comic book art um, all the way through up till now, lots of it, comic rips. But what happened um, is that artists started to shun it a little bit and started to look down on artists that did comic rips and started to, to brag about creating 100% original ANSI. And so we start to see artists using photographs, using their own line drawings, um, and jumping into creativity that wasn't in the ANSI scene. Um, again, I, I love all ANSI art, but early on, there were, a lot of artists weren't very creative. There were a few that are really well known for creating on original art, but most of it's really drawn from these comic rips. Um, it probably didn't hurt that we were mostly teenager boys who had a lot of comic books lying around. But we jump to these, these ones that are more creative as the scene evolves. There's also a little trend in ANSI I like to talk about, it's referred to as goop in the ANSI scene. Uh, you see it here dripping from this guy's mouth in his hand. Uh, it really represented anything dripping, slime, blood, um, just drippy stuff dripping from other unknown objects. This is where I kind of say it turns into almost like a family guy joke. Early people see goop and they're like, oh, that's great. It looks awesome on a Nancy. It's a great technique. Then everybody's using it. Everybody's using it a lot. And it becomes, again, a little passe. But then there are a few artists that start to use it more just because of that until it gets to a point where it's accepted again. And people still use goop um, today. It's a, I mean, it works well with the character sets that you're given. We've looked a lot of pictures today, pics as we call them in Nancy. And that, somewhat reflects the way the ANSI scene was, that they were really a second-class citizen in the early ANSI scene. Fonts were just slapped on the bottom by the artist. A lot of artists, you can identify them just based on the fonts they created because they all pretty much look the same. But in 1996, a group named All was formed and All focused on fonts and worked to, to make fonts as reputable as picks. To where they got to a point where there were fonts that were so elaborate, they just stood as pictures on their own, and font artists were no longer looked at as kind of the bottom line of ANSI. So we get to some very elaborate ones um, that obviously could just be a picture on their own. There's a lot of pulling from graffiti style in ANSI that you'll see in the fonts. If we zoom in here for those not used to, to reading ANSI, in purple here it says 20. Then seven in Roman numerals, VII, and then inch, 27 inch was an ANSI group from the early 2000s. So the last kind of trend I want to talk about is this increase in composition in ANSI. This is actually a really good, really good ANSI by Silverat. Um, I keep forgetting the year, it's probably 96 or 97. Um, but we see a little bit of what's called floating head syndrome in ANSI. This is not a great example of it. Um, Real floating head is just a front view of uh, a character and then a front view of another character and just heads stacked on top of each other. This one does take the profile, get the hand in there, but still we can see the background. It doesn't have a lot going on, just a little shading and a font slapped on the bottom. We see some attempts by Psalms here to do a little more. There's some foliage creeping in. But as artists progress, as we get VGA preview mode, we start to see artists really look at every aspect of the image, top to bottom, and think about each section as it would be viewed. So we get to ANSI's like this spawn one where we see detail in every line of this cape, spawn's head, which never has detail because it's just black. But this is the section I really want to focus on. We see multiple layers here. There's the smoke, and then his cape, and then his chains. And artists are really looking at every line as we go down as being part of the ANSI instead of the background just being filler. That kind of gets through all these trends. Now, um, I just want to run through a bunch of ANSIs from the last five or 10 years. This is actually one of them that snuck it in here, that um, zombie thing with the yellow background was as well. Because, again, people said in 1997 that the ANSI scene died. 
Um, it didn't, it, it changed, it morphed. It became just about artists wanting to draw. There were no, there, there are still bulletin boards, but they're not prominent. Um, and I just want people to see, partic I mean, in particular some old ANSI artists that may not have looked at anything since 1996, 1997, to see that artists have really stepped up their game and they're creating things that we never would have seen, particularly in 92, 93, even 96, 97. Artists have taken it to a whole level um, and are creating things that when you see it in high, high resolution, you may not even realize that it's in ANSI, that it's using text characters to create this because artists have really pushed the boundaries of what they can do with ANSI, especially when we start to see longer answers. There's actually one I'll try to show you at the end that was too big for the uh, slide software to even take. Um, it's, I think, 10,000 lines. It's amazing. It's a whole story. But artists have really started to, to play with what they can do in ANSI and create just great pieces of art. Uh, this is where I start to just babble and get passionate about it and not really have much to say. But there's a lot of great artists out there that didn't start till after 1997 or were kind of new in 1997 that would blow away, honestly, anything that was created in the early days. But that's kind of been, I, I encourage you all to go to look up more of this stuff. Um, a lot of this background made so I couldn't show a ton of art. But I want to talk a little bit about <coughs> archiving the ANSI scene and what has been done as far as that goes. Like I said, I run 16 Colors, which is an, a website that takes all these packs and puts them online. Um, I wouldn't have ever started 16 Colors if not for the Dark Domain DVD, which was created again by Christian Worth, um, that took everything that he could find on FTP sites, on his own hard drives, started digging around other people. Um, electronic magazines, art packs, uh, editing tools, all these scene-related things, and he released a DVD. I snatched it up, put out 16 Colors, which on day one was really just a web version of the packs in the dark domain, but they could be viewed um, you know, on the web, high resolution. You didn't need a special viewer to, to look at them like you did for the DVD. Uh, and it's grown since then. People have uploaded. There have been large batches of files I've gotten from people throughout the community. We've added about 400 packs. So we have close to 4,000 packs, 150,000 files, 20 years of packs. But taking on an effort like 16 Colors is hard for indexing. When in 1992, when all 1993, when we started all this, nobody thought about a website that would have 150,000 images. We did the best we could. Um, DOS, for those that don't know, it's probably not here that doesn't. It was an 11 character limitation, eight characters, a period, three characters. So what we did was we would put an abbreviation for the artist at the beginning of the file. But I was Lord Scarlet, as we mentioned earlier, there's an artist named Lord Soth. We both used LS, so there's no uniqueness there. It's a terrible identification scheme. Um, the multiple artists were the same thing. The joints were me or us generally. Uh, and packs, groups generally used a, an abbreviation for their group, and then a month and date, or, or sorry, a month and year, or a year and month, or a pack number. Uh, the file dates on the packs are kind of useless because of FTP and other file transfers, they don't keep that original file date. So you try to parse out these dates, but um, there are some problems. We'll make it kind of a tedious one, which is that December 2011 and November 2012 have no distinction. There are also groups that use the numbering, which can be tough, not impossible, to pull out with regex compared to a date. There's groups like ACID who just to make our life easy, switched from the date scheme to a number scheme at some point. So you can't even say all acid packs use this pattern. So in 1994, acid released sauce, which in some ways was meant to remedy this problem. Think of it a lot like EXIF that we have now. It was a metadata standard for attaching 128 bytes on the end of a file and putting some metadata in, artist name, group name, month of release, or date of the, the file, but it was used very inconsistently. Not every group used it in particular, not surprising since ASCII released it. ICE never used SAUCE. Um, I, I 
should have asked somebody, but I think they even may have removed it if an artist used it when they had their own specification they were using. Artists that did use it weren't consistent in and of themselves. They might put their handle, they might put their handle with the vowels replaced by numbers. They might put something crazy just because they're bored. Uh, and it doesn't really help me index it at all. Um, multiple artists, same thing. Sometimes groups would put various or multiple artists. Sometimes they would list all the artists. As we get into the 2000s and there's five and six people working on a group, there's a character limitation that was hit. Uh, group name, same problem. So with 16 colors, we have kind of decided not to use sauce. It's displayed with an individual image, but we don't use it for indexing. We tried it at one point, and it just creates more bad data than good. So we're working on a way to just have user, you know, in hindsight, user-created content, tagging, metadata, to make this a lot more easy to index. This talk's not really focused on 16 colors, but we're trying to get that up soon. Um, it's hard in your spare time to get all that up. But when I'm talking about 16 colors and ANSI, 16 colors isn't trying to own ANSI or be the ANSI people. We're just one set of people doing it. Um, we have all the parks we have, packs we have out on GitHub. Um, thank you to them because they removed a restriction on archive size or repository size. It's over two gigs in my, actually I think it's three and a half gigs, which is much larger than any GitHub archive normally is. Um, but it's out there for people to pull down, for people to fork, for people to add to, um, for people to mirror, for them to take off and make their own site just like 16 colors. I don't care. I just, I just want this information out there. I want to keep the history and make sure it's preserved, at, especially as we move further and further from DOS. I'm not the only one doing it. The main one also uh, archiving ANSI art is Jason Scott of textfiles.com. I think a lot of you are familiar with him from DEF CON and other places. Um, if you're not, he's basically the computer historian. Anything computers, computer history, he wants to know about. But he did create a documentary called the BBS Documentary that I recommend to anybody interested in this history. There's a section on ANSI art as well on that documentary. Um, the only question at this point that I have is about the future of ANSI. I would love to keep people, see people keep continuing to draw. There's probably two dozen or so active artists. There's actually been a big upturn in activity thanks to, I hate to say, Facebook. Uh, but everybody's on Facebook whether you like it or not. And we've been able to pull in a lot of the old artists and get them drawing again. It's, it's really nice to see some of these names that you haven't seen for 10 years actually you know, putting characters to ANSI's. There are people trying to make it easy for people to continue drawing, for people to start drawing, although I haven't really seen a new artist probably in a decade. Uh, Curtis is still working on Pablo Draw. There's a version that works on Mac, Linux, and Windows. The, the client server works across all those platforms. There's really no excuses anymore. You can't get asked to draw running in DOS box or whatever. Um, we also have a web-based editor that is in its early stages, but it's at draw.16colors.net. That's also on our GitHub archive if anybody wants to help out. Uh, 16 Colors is also on GitHub. Uh, the tools used to convert the ANSI's to high-res images are also on GitHub. It's all very open. We love help from anybody, input from anybody, criticism from anybody. Um, it's really looked at as a community thing. 16 Colors um, for 10 years has mostly been me. Over the past three or so, uh, there's someone named Brian Cassidy who has actually most of the existing code is his. He's done a great job. A couple other people have helped me over time. Dan Stevenson and uh, um, Thomas Haylott have done a lot as well. Um, Kind of the end. I also wanted to thank um, the. I decided to do this because of the mentor program. I really didn't know what that meant, but it made me feel a little better about doing it. But I didn't really know what a mentor would help with. But Brendan has been awesome. Um, I think his input made this a much better presentation from start to finish. Um, so beyond that, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, sometime, sometime in 1998. Was a different type of format where X bin, X bin, where it, it drew it drew vector art. Even those oh, yeah, you're talking about rip script. Rip script, yeah. It was coming over to the modem, but it was actually 
pointing out where to draw and fill in the colors. Yeah, I think, um, that, Christian, you know when Rip started? Probably more like 94, 95? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that right, 94. Uh, yeah. But it took a little while to really. Uh, yeah, so there's a vector app art format um, that's called Rip Script. Um, I would, you know, I might, but you'd have to do another session. I'll try to pull it up if people stop asking questions, if anybody wants to see it. But not only was it vector art and it had fills and stuff, but the only way to create it showed the creation of it. So anytime you looked at Rip Script, it would, you watch it get drawn. And, and also erase as well. And erase, it was the whole process. So a lot of artists realized they could use this kind of as animation as well. And they use it to scrub pieces and put new pieces in kind of create animation. It's actually been really hard to convert into because nobody really, not that many people picked it up. Um, there are, uh, Pablo Draw can see it. Um, there's a couple other things that can convert it. I don't think there are any editors that work on Windows, um, but it is, on, it is cool to look at. It's kind of a predecessor to Flash in a way. Um, but it also made me think of XBIN. So XBIN was a text mode format released by Acid. It was also IDF format that was similar that was released by somebody else. Uh, and they were, they gave you the ability to customize the palette um, and go up to, I don't know, 36 million or so colors and customize the character set. So artists could, they were no longer limited to 256 characters or to 16 colors, but it was still text characters and there was a lot of cool stuff made from that. Anybody else? Yes. Where do we get the uh, It's just search for it, but it's pico.ca is where it's at. It's also in the Mac app store. Did uh, the anti artists that were submitted to uh, like demo competitions or have their own? Oh yeah. So um, there were a few. Well, let me back up. So there were the the only ones run by the anti scene competition wise that I know of were on on, our, on IRC, but there are a lot of specific ones. Blender in particular, that was were very popular. Blender gave you, I believe, an hour to draw, and it um, gave three random words, and you had to put those into a piece. So um, Blender is the only. This is a big one. There's a few others, but there are a lot of demo parties. There's still um, Evoke, which is I always forget the city it's in. It's in Europe. Um, it's coming up soon. They still do a an ANSI competition every year. Um, but in the 90s, basically every demo party had an ANSI competition. Um, and they would, it, back then it was you had to draw it on premise. As things have gotten smaller, it's now you, have to, you had to draw it that year and not have released it. Now Evo kind of loosened that and you could have put it in a pack. Um, so yeah, there were competitions. Uh, the main one I think of is Blender, which was not out of demo parties. But, uh, the, the demo scene and ANC are funny because you'd think they worked together a lot more than they did, but demos were a lot more popular in like Europe and ANC in America, Australia, and a few other places. Anybody else? Awesome. Why doesn't Bradman have a shirt this thing? <laughs> yeah. On the, on the drawing? Was, I couldn't tell you for sure. There, there was, yeah. There was definitely something going on between Bradman and behind you. And that. <laughs> so there's this whole thing. Where, See? <laughs> I know why. There's, well, <laughs> if, if you're Facebook friends with him, you know why. Yeah. I'll say that. <laughs> oh, oh, it's on now. The, um, Christian's a runner. So he puts pictures from his runners up. That's, that's what it comes down to. Yeah, I don't think that's called running. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's definitely something else that just happened. But. Christian has a, an interesting relationship with the ANSI scene. Can we, um, oh no, this would be important anyway. So this is one yeah. of the really long ones I was talking about that was released recently. It actually, let me look at just the BJ mode because it's so long, that long. So what he's done is just taken and you can see that it's almost like a graphic novel scrolling through this ANSI. This was released just a couple months ago, and it blows my mind all that's being done here in, in this canvas and going so long. He's adapted this storytelling to 
to match with the limitations of the narrow but long campus. Just keep telling. We actually did two of that this thing. And it just keeps on going. It's all, I mean, you can go to the site and read the whole thing, but it's pretty impressive. Um, I also was going to show. <coughs> So this is an animation by Jed, who was kind of the most well-known ANSI artist, or sorry, animation artist in the scene. Um, and if we let this whole thing run, I'm just, if anybody wants to see anything else or talk about anything else, this, can, this runs about four minutes if you let the whole thing go. So we just let it go in the background. But, um, so I was talking about the way it's, it's drawn See, it's just, it, what he's really doing here is just like when the eyes blink, he's drawing characters on it to kind of animate that process. And you see the clear screen between transitions. Uh, the only editor I know of that ever did animation was the draw. I think that's one reason that animation kind of fell, up, fell out once Acid Draw became the prominent ANSI editor. Um, artists just weren't interested in using the draw anymore because Acid Draw, there are, there, there are also probably four other DOS-based ANSI editors somewhere around there, created by different people. Uh, Empathy, ITP Draw, a couple others I'm not thinking of. There was also a viewer by almost every group had a viewer, so you, the way you could, you could go, scroll through a pack like we are here, but in DOS, um, almost every group wrote their own viewer, so you didn't have to worry about loading the right kind of drivers and stuff. Or the NC. Um, it's just going to keep on going. <laughs> it's a nice little story about loyalty. And <laughs> <laughs> so it's I don't know who's been drawing. I can't believe they did that much, but there are also a dozen people in there. Um, you can kind of see there how someone, I mean, a lot of people have different techniques, but so you see how you just keep, a lot of people like this inverse technique. Um, the screen starts black, it's always, it's always started black traditionally. A lot of artists will fill in with gray and then use black to draw the outline. Um, one, I think they just visualize it better, sort of like pen, pen on paper. Um, but also, ultimately, those lines are probably going to be black in the end anyway, and if you draw with the gray, you have to end up Switching that, you really kind of lose track of it. Um, I think this is now, the, this will be the third ANSI with my case in it, but, uh, and the second for Christian. The first one with his shirt off. <laughs> um, let's see, I'm just going to call out who's in there. Avenging Angel, ANSI Christ, Breakfast, uh, Cat Hood, Enzo, Misfit, Retribution, who so far has not drawn a penis. It's very good. And uh, the Creep Fever and Unginant. If any oh, angel was saying, I bet there really is no presentation. It's just an excuse to get this all together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I thought about trying to just like turn Hangouts on or something for the audio to go to them, but I didn't want it to potentially screw everything up. So they, uh, they'll just have to look at it after and find out if it's for real. <laughs> but I, I can't believe this thing's still going. Um, yeah, it's a lot of talented guys doing stuff with a medium that's so so limited that, that you know, you know, I'm kind of latched on as the archivist at this point. I can't do what they do. Um, Christian actually is similar. He, I think he drew one hits he ever, and it wasn't really <laughs> him, it was somebody else. I think it was a ghostwriter. Um, but, um, you know, even again, you know, as, Acid and Ice did a lot for the scene. There are also a lot of smaller groups that don't get enough credit that did a lot for the scene. Um, there was one, kind of as the scene was dying, called The Legion that I really latched onto that um, kind of had a mission to, to really make sure the scene stayed alive. 
but now in the 2000s with Facebook, um, Enzo has been kind of a driving force in keeping things alive. There's a group called Blockchonics that's still releasing Pansy today, and they do an amazing job, and it's all um, Enzo's work getting all that together, and then just the talented guys that are doing the work. It's, you know, I, I kind of tell them all the time that I only, I only have all this because of them. It's, you know, it's not that hard to just display things on the website um, and they deal with the outreach like this. It's still going. <laughs> it didn't start over, did it? No. No. Wow. I mean, think about the time put in to do this animation. It's unbelievable. And he's really. If you search animation on YouTube, it's mostly Jed that comes up because he's just the foremost. You know. One thing about Jed animations is he would uh, actually make them pronounce the vowels and the words. Yeah. So a lot of his animations, if you look at the text that's being written and said, he's, he's sounding them out. He's not just flat to make up. It's Right, right. When I showed this to a couple of people, I think it was Brendan or people, um, they kind of noted how it's, they talk and then, then the text comes up. I don't know why that came about, but if we saw that animation earlier, also making fun of ice, the same technique was used. I don't really know why that was the technique that was used. Uh oh. Should have thought that we did that. <laughs> um, I don't know why that was the technique, it's just kind of what came about. Again, it's like Google at New School, it's just kind of what, how things evolved in the ATC, but that's how they did animation. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so let's see. This was for the Dark Society, which was, was a huge wares board, right? It was no, just it's, hard it's hard. Hard. A lot of these boards overlap as wares and art boards, so it can be hard to <laughs> So that's a dead end. Thanks, everybody. Tell them thanks, Christian. Yeah, it was, I threw that one in at the last minute when I realized that it was a good spot to put it in. Uh, it's great. But, uh,